Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another Talent Talks podcast. I'm your host, Scott Rivers, and today is another exciting show. Certainly for me, it is, and I hope that you're going to get a lot out of this content. Um, I, I know that I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm going to jump right into it, and I'll tell you why. You know, you've got certain books and content that you remember through your career, that you read it at a certain time. You can remember exactly where you were when you saw it or picked it up. And today's guest, Rob Stevenson, has one of those books for me. His book, How to Soar Like an Eagle in a World Full of Turkeys, came to me at a time where it just happened to resonate with me. And I remember where I was when I picked it up. I remember who I was with. It was a, a Kinko's at the time. For those of you that remember those stores, they're now FedEx. I think they went to FedEx Kinko's. Now they're just FedEx stores. But I remember walking in and seeing this book and thinking, you know what, that makes sense to me. Let me take a look at this. So I grabbed it and read it. I still have it on my bookshelf today. And so for that, I am really excited. I, I hope you guys really enjoy this. Rob's latest book, Raise Your Line, is also something we talk about today. We'll go into some of the detail on that. I enjoy the fact that uh, Rob writes books that make sense, uh, certainly that make sense to me. You can find Rob right here on LinkedIn. He is very active on the platform. He puts out really good content. As always, as all of the people that we're, we're talking to on a daily basis here at the podcast that I'm talking to online, that we're jumping into um, you know, different chats with and having communication with, these guys are active on the platform. And I, and I think for those of you that aren't, there's no time like the present to jump in and start doing just that. You can also find Rob on his website, and you'll see that at robertstevenson.org. I'll put that in the show notes so that you can go check it out. But I, I find Rob to be very engaging and, and very smart, and it all comes through in this podcast. I hope you enjoy it. Do me a favor, reach out to Rob on LinkedIn. Let him know you found out about him or heard his information on the Talent Talks podcast. Go ahead and follow him there. I know you'll get a lot of great information. Before we jump into the show, I want to remind you, and I know I keep reminding you, but you've got access to a free resource on our website. We've written a book called The Art of Hiring A Players Today. I think today more than ever, it's difficult to hire good people. People are reluctant. They're not looking to make moves, even though our industry has done, I'll say fairly well during this time. Um, a lot of people are still finding it difficult to make the move. You need to make sure that you're going through the right process to attract the right talent. And I think this book gives you some pointers in order to do that. So here he is on the Talent Talks podcast, Robert Stevenson. Great interview. I hope you guys get a lot out of it. I look forward to your comments and feedback. <music> Guys, Robert Stevenson on the show with us today, and he and I have been talking for a little bit now, and, and my reasons for asking him on go back a long time in my sales career, and we're going to go into some of the details on that. But Rob, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. I'm del del delighted to be here. Uh, that's cool. But you got a very cool background. You've written some great books, and we're going to go into you know some of those that I remember as I was starting my sales career. But what I'd love to know, Rob, is what got you started into the writing and keynote speaking that you're doing today? How did you get started with that? Well, I, I, I own five companies. And when I sold my last company, I was, I was still pretty young. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I, a friend of mine was the president of a bank. And he said, uh, well, why are you trying to figure out what to do? Why don't you come in and do some sales training for my bank? Because mm. banks were changing and expanding. And I was like, I don't know anything about banking, David. And he said, he said, well, you've been borrowing money from me for 20 years. He said, <laughs> he said you know a little bit more about it than you think. So long story short, I, I did some training and I was like going, well, I like this. And, and, and plus having owned my own companies and been, and been in sales because when you own your own companies, you're selling all the time. That's right. Um, I, you know, in those days you listen to cassettes, mm -hmm. you know, and I'd listen to speaker after speaker after speaker and, and heard the great ones. And so I said, you know, I think I got, I think I got something I can share. So I flew up to the National Speakers Association's annual conference, walked around and said, this is what I'm going to do. It's a very backward industry. You have to have a video to get a booking. You have to have a booking to get a video. So it's it's a hard business to get into. But I started going out there and speaking everywhere I could. And then I, 
Um, and then I, I expanded it from there, but that's, that's how I, that's how I got into the speaking business. And then when you, and writing your book, when I started speaking, people would walk up to you after a program, they go, do you have a book? And I would go, Oh no. And they'd go, Oh, <laughs> I wrote the book because of, Oh, you know, I got so many, Oh, well, you're not a special speaker because you don't have a book. <laughs> and so I'm like going, well, darn, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to write a book. So I spent a year. And uh, I, I, you know, I got up at an hour and a half earlier every morning and went to bed basically about an hour and a half later every night and decided that I was going to write and write and write and write. And, um, I, and I just I just wrote. I've always told people, if you want to write a book, just write. Don't don't just just write. And then I sent it to several of my dearest friends. And I said, what do you think? And I'll never forget uh, Susan Andreone, who's a marketing genius. She uh, she said, Rob, she says, why are your chapters in this order? And I said, because that's how I wrote them. <laughs> and she said, maybe we can move them around a little bit and kind of correlate them because we have different points. And I was like going, well, that, that makes a whole lot of sense. But mm -hmm. I, 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 I write the way I speak. All right. Just, just trying to be very simple at it. And I wrote the book. I had my, my mission in, was to give people some material that I wish someone had told me when I first got into business. That's what I wanted. Give it to me quick. It, there's 47 chapters in, in How to Soar Like an Eagle or a World Full of Turkeys. Right. And uh, the, the, the title just came to me. I don't know how it came to me, but it, it turned out to be a really great title that people love. It's catchy, that's can, for sure. They can relate to it, you know, because you're surrounded by turkeys. I have 86 examples of people being turkeys in the book. And, you know, and then there's all kinds of turkeys. There's bad turkeys, terrible turkeys, and people that don't even classify turkey. They go over the top. But uh, people got a kick out of that. And then basically what it was was, uh, you know, this is how you get, you know, better at what you do. I mean, there's chapters on everything. I mean, from dealing with stress to dealing with emotion to dealing with a lot of the longest chapters. And there was dealing with sales, because mm -hmm. if you're going to be successful, you, you might not be a salesperson, but you're going to have to sell your ideas in management. You have to sell your ideas to your colleagues. You know, so I, I spent a little bit more time on that. But that's how I got into it. And then uh, and then I just progressed from there. Because it's it was it was something I had a you know I, I really had a a want to on that. Sure, I, I definitely agree on that sales. Um, what, what you're talking about with sales, I think that while some people are labeled as sales people, which mm -hmm. I, I think I think you have to train, you have to um, hone your craft if you want to be a salesperson. It's not natural. Some people no. are good talkers, but sales is not natural. But you know that being said, it, it's. Um, it's an art that people need to learn because 100% of the time you're either selling yourself an idea or a product. And that's regardless of whether or not you're in sales. So I thought the book was fantastic. And Rob and I were talking before we actually started recording. I believe this might've been one of the first business books that I grabbed off of a shelf. And for those of you who remember walking into a Kinko's where we would have to go print a presentation, we couldn't just email them back then we had to go print it. And by the way, if there was something wrong, you had to print it again. again. So I spent a lot of time in Kinko's. I remember grabbing that book off of one of the kiosks that they had in Kinko's right, right. 20, 25 years ago and reading it. And so I, I think that's part of the reason why I think this is so cool that we're talking today, Rob, because you helped me get started in my sales career and business career. And, and I think how to soar like an Eagle was a great start for me to start learning. I appreciate that. Yeah, it was, it was a fun book to write. Well, that's great. And we can talk more about it when we have uh, a little more time later. I too was also listening to all of those tapes. So you're talking about being in sales. I was one oh, yeah. of those guys who had tapes going constantly, Zig Ziglar, you know, anyone and everyone that I could learn from, right. uh, including Robert Stevenson would be someone that I was listening to. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and, and Zig, one of the great ones, he was, uh, he was, he, he was, uh, I, there's a long story about that. We don't have time for today, but uh, he was one, re one of the reasons why I got into speaking. Is that right? And then, uh, yeah. Cause I was, I was, I was in a, I was in a, pretty much a funk. I, I, uh, well, I'll go ahead and tell you the quick story. Let's hear the story. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, I got it. I got hurt playing football at Georgia tech. Um, my brother had played pro ball. I wanted to play pro ball. Uh, and so it was kind of like, well, you, you're, you're done. You're not going to be playing. I wore a steel brace for four years and it was kind of like, that's it. Mm -hmm. So I needed a job. I got into insurance sales and, and which I, you shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't sell insurance when you're 21 years old, you really don't need it. But, but I had a great mentor and trainer and who, who helped me. But a friend of mine said, look, you're kind of in a funk. Let's go hear this guy. 
So it was when they were having those big, huge, you know, 20,000 people and like nine different speakers. Mm -hmm. And I'm up in the top rafters, don't even want to be there. And there's Zig Ziglar. And I listened to Zig Ziglar and there was a story about David Logic, which is an incredible story. And I'm sitting there saying to myself, oh, my God, I, I, I'm upset because I don't get to play football anymore. You know, I, I you know, I, at that time, people have been coming back from Vietnam without missing body parts and all kinds of other things. And and, and you're upset because you you don't you know, that was the ridiculous. Right. And he he got me out of that funk. And then and then I went on from there and uh, became rookie of the year that year and, and you know, in the sales and 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 decided, you know, this is what I want to do. And then I also decided, I said, someday I want to be on that stage talking to 20,000 people. And when I was 40 years old, I talked to 20,000 people. Made it happen. Uh, yeah. So, and then I also got to work with Zig. That's great. Yeah, that was great. That was great. I, I had the opportunity to see him live as well. I believe it was in, I believe it was in North Carolina that, that he was at an event that I got to go see. And right just an awesome individual, great person. I know he's helped. Great person. Oh, yeah. great person. And you can tell that, right? You could tell from even sitting in an audience, you know, in, in the second level, as far back as you can get, you could tell just a great person who wants to give. Yeah, that's what he was. I mean, yeah. that, that's what was so wonderful about him. I mean, uh, he, he, he was just real. He was right. just, he, he, there was, there was no he, uh, sizzle about it. He was just telling the stories and, and, you know, I, and he taught me, talk to their heart, you'll get to their head. And, and, and that's, and that's the way he was. So uh, what a loss. Yep. It really was. And, but Rob, don't you, don't you feel that some of the best salespeople are, are those who give of themselves? You, you kind of feel that, um, I, we'll call it an inner warmth, right? You, you, mm -hmm. you, there's a genuine nature to them that you feel comfortable giving more information to them and therefore you get more information back. And then that makes that sales relationship better. Well, when I go into sales organizations, and this 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 statement will probably scare some senior vice presidents of sales. I I we like I, doing I that on this show. Yeah, I, I I sit there and I say, quit selling. I said, help them to help help. Four letter words. They're four. You know, success in selling are four letter words: help, care, seek, find, look. But the key word is care. Mm. When they find out that you care about the situation, when they find out that you're trying to find out about the situation, that you're actually trying to help them and not trying to sell them something, I just want to sell you something so I can make my commission, you know, then the next thing, you know, they, they open up to you. Right. And so, so, so you're, you, you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, the, uh, and, 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 and in today's COVID environment, because now all of a sudden you can't go in there and shake the hands and buddy them up and meet them at the association meeting and, and, and have all this touch and go to the golf course and all the different things that you might have done previously built, trying to build relationships. Now all of a sudden you've got to really hook into the empathy side right. of what's going on with your clients. And so, and, and, then, and a lot of salespeople have a problem with that, but yeah. You know, and, and I look at it with, with virtual, mm -hmm. um, People say, well, you can't do it virtually. Well, I'm looking right at your eyes right now. All right. I can see, I can see your body language. I can, I can hear your voice. I can hear every aspect of what's going on. So I have a real problem with people that tell me, well, you can't do it virtually. Yeah, you can. In fact, if you want to know the truth, it's, it's, it's even better. Uh, when, I, when I teach people about speaking, I can talk to 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, or 10,000 people. But when I'm on stage, regardless of how many people I'm talking to, I'm talking to one. Just one, one at a time. I'll be making eye contact with those people. I don't care if there's 10,000 people in the audience, I'll be making eye contact. Well, in the virtual environment, now all of a sudden I'm sitting there and I'm looking at that dot. Well, that dot, that dot is you. Right. And I'm talking to you so you can see my eyes. So if I really want to connect, I can sit there, instead of looking down here where I can see you when I can talk to you and I can participate in what's going on, if I really want to connect, I want to go right at that dot. And I'm going to sit there and talk to him and say, this is what you need to do. And you can convey your message to the people properly, but you got to practice. And then, and, and then they can they go back to what you just said, the care part. If you have the passion and caring about the client, then you don't have to sell them. You help right. them get what they need. You're right, Rob. Let, let's talk about that practice for a minute, because I think that a lot of people, when they're walking in, and, and, and unfortunately, it happens way too often. I, I feel like salespeople, when they're walking into accounts, most of the time, they don't have a plan. Um, right. unless they're being guided and coached and, and mentored and managed correctly, they don't have a plan. They're going in and continuing to build a relationship, but there's mm -hmm. not a, there's not a flow of what they're trying to accomplish when they're going in. 
And I think today more than ever, you have to have a plan. Number one, you got to, you have to bring value when you're getting on people's calendars. You have to do anything and everything you can to bring value, but there's got to be a plan and a process and you've got to follow that. Otherwise, we we could sit here all day and just talk and get mm -hmm. nothing accomplished. Right. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's like when I do a speaking engagement, all the speaking engagements I do are, are customized. I don't do generic programs. I customize it to the client. I pick up the phone. I call them. I call their key people. I find out what it is. It's, it's their program. In fact, when they look at my program descriptions, I tell them, it's like a grocery store. Go in there and pick several topics that you like, leadership or sales or, or dealing with stress or all of the above. I don't care. And because it's their program. But as you said, then I mold a program around that to guide them all the way through a one hour presentation to where I, I want to take them. Well, in a sales call, it's exactly the same thing. Where do you want to take them? Well, well, first of all, when you say, I, I don't know if I want to take you somewhere, I need to find out where you need to go. Mm -hmm. And if I can find out where you need to go, what you're looking for, and I can help you get there, then, then it's a win-win. But the other side of the coin is if I don't have what you need, I'll go help, I'll go find somebody who does. Right. I'll pick up the phone and call somebody and say, by the way, we don't do this, but this is what he needs. And I know you do that. And the reason why I do that is because someday I'm going to have something they want. And then they're going to say, Rod didn't try and put my square peg in a round hole. He helped me and he got this guy over here. So you're, you're exactly correct. You, you can't go in and wing it. Sure. You've got to have a plan. You've got to have what you want to do. And you've got to be and the, the, one of the biggest mistakes salespeople will make are they're not prepared. And I can go all day on that one. We could, we could spend a lot of time there. And we will. Maybe on the next call, we'll do that, Rob. All right. All right. Um, it's very different. You know, you, you tailor your keynotes and your presentations. You create new material often. Whereas I, I feel like most people in, in your line of work kind of have the same thing that they go back to. And, and I, I don't want to say regurgitate, but it is. It's the same message that they carry time and time again. I love the fact that, that you go in truly consult with your clients, figure out what they need, and then develop something genuine and new for them. I think it's the reason why I've been so successful in, in, in states along in the industry is that um, um, well, I, I remember when I went out to the National Speakers Association's annual conference and they said, well, you have to be a specialist. You have to specialize in change. You have to mm -hmm. specialize in leadership. And I'm like going, I've owned five companies. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a jack of all trades. I might be a master of none, but I'm a jack of all trades. And so when I look at business and I'm talking to people, I, I look at it as an entrepreneurial situation, whereas right. there's lots of subjects that you need to talk on. And so, and so when I, when I customize the program and a lot of speakers tell me I'm nuts for doing it because it's hard, right? You it can, is. you got to make a lot of phone calls. You got to talk to a lot of people, but the other side of the coin is I'm talking to some really smart people. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting, gaining from them. So I'm, I'm, I'm staying current what's going on in the marketplace. You do the same program for three years, stale. Get stale. Yeah. So, but if you're talking to people all the time and they're their top salespeople, or their top leaders, their top managers, they're, they're, they're top players, and you're listening to what they're saying, and then, and then you incorporate that into the program. Number one, the client is very appreciative that you took the time to learn about their business. And number two, you're gaining a plethora of information mm -hmm. because you're talking to stars. Yep. So, you know, so I, I mean, I've done 2,500 programs. I've interviewed over 10,000 people. That's a lot of interviews. That is a ton. Yeah. 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 And, and, and it it's keeps also you a lot fresh. of great material. Right. And it keeps you fresh and it keeps your material keeps fresh. You fresh. Yep. And it keeps yeah. you relevant. Spe speaking of, you know, we've kind of passed, we're kind of off the uh, tracks here, but that's all right. That's okay. Let's take a step back. Um, during all of this time, I think that, uh, you know, learning, educating yourself and, and staying fresh has been really important. I know for me, what have you been doing? What have you been listening to reading to make sure that you're continuously learning and growing and, and being there for your clients for the future? I like LinkedIn. Okay. okay. LinkedIn, because uh, I, and I scroll LinkedIn and I, you know, I have a lot of followers on LinkedIn. And, 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 and by the way, I, I usually post something every day to try and help people. But I do a lot of reading on LinkedIn and watching different videos of different industries because it has so many various different industries. Mm -hmm. And then, and then that'll carry me over. Um, every night I try and watch something on YouTube. 
okay. um, to j- j- a video on sales, on, on, on happiness, on dealing with stress, or I don't care, something that just tri- trips my trigger that I might have stumbled upon on LinkedIn or, or, or Twitter or whatever, whoever. And I get, I'm very fortunate that I have lots of business people who send me things. Mm-hmm. Watch this, watch that. Um, and, and so I, you know, I'll watch them. And then, and then I get hooked in on some certain people. Well, right now, I'm, I'm a fan of Simon Sinek. Okay. I like the way, you know, I, I, like, I love his, you know, his first big one was why. Right. I thought that was a great job. And, and I just like the guy. I, mm-hmm. I just like the way he talks. I like the way he relates. I like the way he delivers. You know, I like his, his laid back attitude. But but he, he cuts to the core, all right. He does. And then if I want to, then if I want to really get down and, and dirty and get into leadership, then I'm I'm, I'm going to deal with uh, you know Marshall Goldsman, mm. um, which who, who is a major player, John Maxwell. I mean, so uh, you know, so you, you go out and you study these people. And my statement is, just go watch a short video. And, you know, that's why I like TED Talks. TED Talks, you know, is in 20 minutes you get some really good stuff right. from some some brilliant people, and you can you can scroll through the titles. So to keep myself sharp, I'm always looking for new and different theories or thoughts or what other people are thinking. Because like when I wrote my book, everything in my book, I learned from somebody else. I wasn't born with this stuff. That's right. I, you know, I, I learned it from somebody. Yeah. And so, uh, and, 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 my, and when I write, my whole objective is to shorten your learning curve. You, you don't have enough time to do it yourself, screw it up the, you know, every time. So shorten the learning curve and learn from somebody else. And that's, so that's what I do, and then I, and I suggest that to everybody. You, you, someone did you, you want a four letter word for success? Read. Read. Yeah, and so many people say that, and, and and I'm an avid reader. I've got books all over the place, and and they've helped me to do everything from learn how to technically put together a podcast to you know you know train teams and build teams, and you know, I, I've always wanted to keep that learning um, right. fresh, and so I do a lot of the same things that you're talking about. And I look for people like yourself who have done something that I want to do because then I can learn it even faster. So, you know, buying and selling or or building and selling four companies, five companies, you know, these are things that are exciting to me. And I think a lot of people do the same thing because of that. Um, You mentioned leadership and I I want to jump into that. I, I think leadership today is so important because, you know, as we stepped into this pandemic back in March, nobody knew really what to do. And everybody was looking for someone to lead and guide them. Well, here we are eight or nine months later, we're still a lot of times in that same place. Mm-hmm. You know, certain parts of the country are locked down. Certain people are still not able to go do anything. I think leadership today is so important. What should leaders be doing a better job of today that would be the biggest impact for their team during this time? Communication. Um, I, mean, every, 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 I mean, here we are on Zoom. All right. right. I, mean, I mean, how many people were talking about Zoom a year, year and a half ago? Not now very many. Yeah, and, and now it's, it's almost as common as, as clinics. You know, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to have a Zoom meeting, and which probably upsets all the other companies that have their their formats. <laughs> yes. Okay, and it's not a Zoom meeting. It's you know, but uh, there are lots of good ones out there. But it's, but to me, it's communication because what happens is now all of a sudden I have somebody at home. All right. Well, the motivation, the praise, the t- the teamwork, the camaraderie. You know, all the things that help to go in and make a company what a company is, which we refer to as culture, mm-hmm. all right, doesn't go away just because you put them in another room. You put them away. You've, you've got to be able to create that. So you, so um, I, yeah, I, I think you still need to be hands on and you can have your group meetings to where everybody can see each other and they can hear things and everything else. But you also have to have your smaller groups and you also have to have your individual conversations. Because to me, that's what the manager's got to be locked in on. And, and I think one of the most powerful words today in leadership and in sales is, is empathy. I mean, yeah. right now, if, you, if, you're, if you're picking up the phone or you're doing a Zoom or you're trying to, you're trying to sell somebody, the worst thing that you can do is, is, is try and sell something when some of these companies are just trying to survive. I mean, their cash flow is awful. They've laid off half of their people. And so all of a sudden, they, 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 a salesperson calls them up. Are you kidding me? Right. But wait a second. Their business hasn't stopped. So you got to find out where they're at. So if you can really empathize with what's going on and have some really great questions of what's, what's happening with them and, is there, and what you can do to help, then the next thing you know, it, it changes exponentially. 
Well, same thing is true with your people. You got to be in tune to what's going on. Some people handle isolation fine. Others are terrible at it. And they, and they, and they, and they feel like they're lost. So the manager's job is to make sure that they're on point, doing the things they need to do and, and still be in the, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm an optimist, but I'm a cheerleader. Mm-hmm. And, that, and then that's what I think leadership is all about. Yeah. It's helping people get better. So you, so the manager's got to be on top of what's going on and be able to read those people. And sometimes a group zoom meeting doesn't get you to read all the people. And, and then if all, in a smart manager, if you have a lot of people on a Zoom meeting, I'm going to have a, an assistant manager looking at some of the other people to watch their body language because you can't watch them all to see who might be tuning out, who might not be hooked in, who might not be, you know, who, who needs help. Sure. And, and, that's, and, and that's what management is. It's helping people get better. Yeah. And, and it's funny. I've talked to a lot of managers about that over the past, you know, seven, eight months how somebody on their team, that loneliness that you talk about, especially, right. especially salespeople, right? We, you know, we like to be engaged. We like talking to other people and being. Thought I had that off. I'll cut that out. I didn't. <laughs> That's the first great thing about that. Cut, take, we will out. cut that out. Yeah. By, by the way, I didn't hear it. Oh, okay. All right, good. That's good microphone, I guess. But it, I was like, yeah. I thought I had that turned off. It's weird that it came through. Yeah. Um, but, but Rob, especially salespeople, I think, you know, people who are used to being engaged with others, they're used to being mm-hmm. out and about, mm-hmm. or if we're talking an inside sales team, there's a bullpen. And if something happens, you know, you have someone there to, to cheer you on or, or laugh at you. Ring the bell. Yeah, the next ring the sale. bell. And so now yeah. everyone's at home. And so, yeah. you know, I watch my team closely, but I've had those conversations with managers that they're having to do the same thing during this time. So that communication is key. And I like what you said about the empathy too. It's, it's being able to put yourself in their shoes to determine, you know, what would be best for them and that individual. So, so management wise, you know, leadership wise, these are things that hopefully everyone is doing out there, watching your team, communicating with them over communicating. Um, Do you recommend video for everything at this point? No. I mean, uh, for, for quick things, I uh, text it because dealing with millennials, they love text yes. and they'll jump right on it. I mean, so I'm going to communicate. I, I always learned a long time ago, communicate on the level they like to communicate on. Mm-hmm. So if I got to get to them quickly, how do you want me to get to you? Well, if text is your deal, fine. If I got a boomer, you know, then I'm going to pick up the phone. Okay. If I got an Xer, then I'm going to email them. Okay. All right. So, so know your uh, audience. Or, or all of the above. Right. But, you know, it's, but you want to find out. But as far as I'm concerned, I still like to look at you. Yeah. So Zoom is so simple that all I have to do is sit there and say, let's get on a Zoom. Let's take 10 minutes. Let's talk. And I can look at you and see what's going on. You know, I mean, all the way, all the way down to what they're wearing. Mm-hmm. You know, so did, did they take a shower today? Are they out of their PJs? <laughs> you know, so, you know, because yeah. I've seen some people on some Zoom calls. And I'm like going, really? Oh, are yes. You, are, you, are you kidding me? Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, so, but yeah, I, I, I like visual. I mean, okay. you know, but, but at least I'm going to hear your voice. Okay. Yeah. So, so know your audience, know who, know who yeah, you're talking absolutely. to, and then you can kind of determine that. What do you think? Like right now, I feel like we've had an opportunity for everyone to get better. Okay. So, mm-hmm. so if you, if you've missed this last eight months, there's no time like the present to start getting better at whatever it is you do, whether it's selling or, or communicating or all of this stuff. One of the things that I think that companies should be doing is trying to figure out if there's things that they could be doing better. What do you recommend companies do in order to get that feedback of what, what changes they should be making or what they could do better for their customers? Do you have recommendations for companies or people on how to get that insight? Well, good God, don't do a survey. <laughs> no surveys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, going, are you just, let's do a survey. All right. So I'm not in, I'm not in the survey. Okay. Sorry. But, but but when you, when you try and find out what's really going on with the client is 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 to pick up the phone, is to pick up the phone and, and see, or or another thing that you can do is to do some research within your industry mm-hmm. and to see what you can do as far as maybe send them an email saying these are some of the things that I'm finding out that are working with other companies right now during this time of of, of COVID, you know how they re how they refinance different things looking for little things that can help that company succeed. All right. 
you know, right now you're thinking of, you know, do I, is, is it smart for me to lay off 50% of my people or should I reduce the salary of top management and some of my people but keep everybody? Mm. You know, there's, there's, there's so many different things that you need to, you need to take a look at. So, but you've got to, as far as your customer is concerned, what can I do to help that customer survive? So look at it as a survival mode. Now, some of them might be kicking butt sure. and, and, and then that's wonderful. But the only way you can find that out is to is to ask the right questions. So when you go into it, when you go back to the four letter word care, when you go back and you pick up the phone and I sit there and I and I pick up the phone, and I say, Scott, Rob, how you doing? What's going on? What's changed? What are some of the biggest things that you're dealing with right now that are driving you nuts? Yeah. All right. You know, is there anything I can do to help or any resources that we have in my company or people that I know? that I can help you in your situation. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you can get them to kind of talk about it, and sometimes you're going to have to, you're going to have to dig, dig a little bit deeper. One of my clients you know, did a refinance, you know, and, uh, and, 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 and saved himself, you know, $40,000 per month. Well, mm -hmm. to some companies that, that could be a lot of money, right. you know, or $400,000 per month. So it was like, wow, we hadn't thought of that. We hadn't done, what can you do to lock into that client? So you better be really good at asking questions which to me is what sales is all about anyway. That's right. So, so when you go into it, you get go to the care, go to the empathy, and get really good at questions to find out what you can do. And then if there's something that you can do to help them sell, and they might sit there and say, you know, I really need that, you know, Rob, but I, I just can't pay for it right now. Mm -hmm. Well, what kind of terms do you need? You need six months? Well, normally we, you, know, you give us, you know, 45 days. You need three months? Well, you, yeah, three months would really work great. Fine. We'll take right. care of that. Flexibility. All of a sudden, change. you're helping them. Yes, yes. And, and I've but heard sometimes they just back away because they don't want to be embarrassed. Right, and that's where that questioning and, and open communication can come into play. Right. And and I've heard you also say this before: something to the effect of you know going to your clients and saying, "Hey, look, we've had a partnership over the last six or twelve months, um, and we hope that that's gone really well. But if it had been a perfect partnership, what mm -hmm. else would we be doing for you to be able to help you out?" And then getting getting that feedback as well. Well, and, and, and the, the, I can't believe you made that statement. That's that's in one of my programs when I talk about sales and the and the companies that I own. All right, you know we we did, we had repeat customers, so every six months we went to them, not on the phone, not an email, not a survey. We went to them face to face, and we asked basically that question. We asked in a perfect world if we could provide you perfect service. What are we not providing you? Mm, that's it. And then, and then shut up. Right. Because then all of a sudden, if they start to talk, you might find out a new product or service that you can have for them. You know, find out the, you find out things you're doing wrong. Because what people have got to understand is that today, in today's world, people don't call up and complain usually. They just pick up the phone and go, go to your competitor. Mm. All right. And, 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 then, and, and then you say, well, you didn't tell me there was a problem. And my statement is you didn't ask. Right. You know, uh, in fact, I just put a video out on my LinkedIn today talking about follow up. I said in sales, it's your job to follow up just because you have a support staff, just because you have service people. They're going to make sure that it got there, got there on time and everything's good. My statement is, no, I'm the salesperson from cradle to grave. I'm going to pick up the phone and say, hey, did it get there, Scott? Was everything cool? Any surprises? Anything I need to know about? I just want to be on top. Well, thanks, Rob, for calling. Uh, no problem. Just making sure you know, just making sure you're happy. As long as you're happy, I'm happy. That's right. So if you're following up with that person and you're caring about them like it's your own personal company, when you start thinking of it like it's your personal company and you're spending your money, but it's their money, it's a game changer. Yes, it is. But people don't do that. Well, I, and, and I have to live with, first of all, I live by a calendar, right? Everything goes in the calendar. And then I've got mm -hmm. a to-do list for those types of things because I'll go into a million different directions. And then I, I, you lead me to my own vices and I'm going to forget something. But I right. have to live on the calendar and I have to live with my to-do items, which I've got, you know, a million of them for this afternoon that I'll do those follow-ups that you're talking about. But it makes a difference. It really makes a difference. And they think they, they appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I think I really appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you know, and, and then and, and then send them a note. If you really want to differentiate yourself, instead of sending them an email after the fact after the order, send them a card. 
in the mail. Wait, Rob, how, how no do you do that? No one does that. How, how do you do that? I don't even. Yeah, how do you how do you mail? <laughs> you know, it has a little postage thing that you put in the top right hand corner. One of those weird things. You know, I mean, I, and and they get it and they go, well, wasn't that nice of Rob to send me a note? You know, just making sure everything's cool. I thought you'd like this quote. Yeah, that's nice. You know, little things, building relationships. You know, change is hard for anyone. And, and I feel like over the past, you know, eight months, 12 months, um, there's been a lot of changes that people have been forced into. But is there a way to teach people to pivot and make changes faster and easier? I mean, is there a way to do that? There's a, I'll give you an example. This is an example that I've used in programs. I said, I said let's talk about change. Because first of all, you, you, when you say the word change, the hair goes up in the back of people's necks. Right. Always. So, you know, it's just like, oh gosh, change. So my statement is, rather than use the word change, why not talk about tweak, adapt, adjust? In other words, when, when you, you're dealing with a salesperson and they, and they make their presentation, you say, well, you need to change this. It's like, wow. Right. But you could say, you know, with a couple of adjustments, that's going to be a home run. Wow. That person is like feeling good about them. So I only need a couple of adjustments. That sounds but no, a lot we're going to change, change this. Yeah. All right. So, but the example that I give is I'll, I'll sit there. I'll tell everybody in the audience. I'll say, fold your hands. So I'll, you know, get your hands again and fold your hands, and then yeah. and they'll all fold their hands. And then I say, okay, how many got your left thumb over your right? Yeah, and then a bunch of people will raise their hand. And how many got your right thumb over your left? And some will raise their hand. And I say, I'll give you some. I'll give you some serious data. I have no clue. <laughs> why right or left or left or right that's not the point that i'm trying to make but everybody that has your right over your left or left over your right switch and everybody will switch and they'll go oh that feels terrible that's awful that's just disgusting i just I, it just feels weird and i'm going yeah but if you did it that way for six months the other way would feel odd yeah so when you look at change i'm always sitting there saying to myself how do i change the thumb over well what are the reasons for it why do I want to do this? So is it going to make me better? Is it going to make me smarter? Is it going to make me more money? I mean, I'll ask a question at the beginning of a program. Okay, how many people in this room want to make more money? I'm there. Okay. I said, oh, so now I got your undivided attention. Because what I'm going to talk about is how we're going to make more money. That's how we can shorten your learning curve, how you can make less mistakes, and how you can make more money. Right. Pay attention. That's how I wrote the first book, How to Soar Like an Eagle. You know, read this and it's going to help you be more, be more successful for 99% of the people out there. Some people now nah. <laughs> you can take it to them. You can't make them drink. That's right. But, but the other side of the coin is when I look at change, it's kind of like, why do I want to do this? What is this? What is this going to help? And, and then, and then you do it. And I'll give you one simple example. Okay. That's a tough example for me to, sh to share because it's about my son. When he was nine, he was diagnosed with juvenile diabetes. Mm. Nine years old. Get a phone call, come to all children's hospital. They hand you an orange, they hand you a, a syringe, they teach you how to take, give shots. I'm like, who am I giving a shot to? My son. What? I didn't give a shot to myself. Now I'm going to give it to my son. But all of a sudden, your entire world changes. Right. All right. And you have no alternative. This is what you are going to deal with. All right. And so you, 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 you got to put on a game face and you've got to, it changes your life, instantly changes your life. But I will tell, tell you one thing. It has been an amazing help to me in my career, watching how my son deals with it and how we deal with it and how you just kind of say, that's the way it is. Well, with COVID, when, when COVID, had, I mean, I've been speaking for 29 years. In 29 years, I have never done a virtual keynote from my office studio in 29 years, okay? All of a sudden, my last speaking engagement live was February 9th, uh, February 9th, 2019. I'll remember that as long as I live. And then the calendar went black. I mean, no one's doing speaking engagements, period, paragraph. So I had a choice, learn virtual or don't speak. Well, I had never done one. So what did I do? I went into a hole for 30 days. Mm -hmm. Every morning I got up, I studied, I read, I looked, I studied, I read, I looked, and I called people and everything else and figured out how to do that. Figured Why? Because you, 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 because that's the way it is. Yes. You have no choice. So I got to look, I got to learn how to talk into that camera. I got to learn how to do, deliver the same thing. And then I said, wait a second, as I just told you, 
If I talk to one, a thousand or 10,000, I'm talking to one person at a time. I got no problem with this. That's right. So I'm just going to do it a different way. So we're going to set it up. We're going to shoot it in a way. And I'm still going to do my interviews. I'm still going to talk to the people. I'm still going to customize. So I looked at the positive parts of it. So adapt and then, I, and change. And then, and then, and then you, you adapt to change, but then you sit there and say, and then it's going to work like a charm. And then you, and then you let your agents <laughs> know, and you let your clients know. And guess what? It worked. Back in business. It worked. But that's what you, and the same thing goes with the salespeople. This is what you need to do. You need to figure out how you're going to make your presentation to them virtually, talking to them, relating to them, getting your message to them. So it's going to work. And, and so my statement is when you look at change, why? So, All right. Well, if, if, the, if, the, if it makes sense, then do it. It's almost like the Nike commercial. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Yeah. yeah. But, but the thing about it with Tyler's diabetes, we had no choice. That's right. Yes. Well, guess what? With COVID, technically you have no choice. So you, you either change, adapt, or you're gone. It's that simple. No question. You know, I, I'm, I'm seeing behind you uh, Raise Your Line, which I believe was was your latest book. And yes, it sir. wasn't written in 2020, but no. I, I, I feel like it was written for 2020. So, <laughs> so you know, tell us a little bit about Raise Your Line and, uh, you know, what kind of led to that book? Well, I, I, I had, a, I had a, a major publisher contact me who wanted me, who had written one, had read one of my articles and okay. wanted me to write a book called Realistic Optimist. Mm-hmm. And so we were getting it all hooked up and everything else. And then I said, um, I called him back and I said, I can't write the book. He said, why? I said, Realistic Optimist is a chapter. It's not a book. It's a chapter. I said, but, I was, so, but I'm going to write the book anyway. So I wrote the book basically like kind of like How to Soar. Mm-hmm. You know, with, and, and in it, I wanted to, I wanted to have cut through the minutia. So there's a square box and there's a, the, in the book, if you, if you go through the book and you just, and you just fan, fan through the book like this, there's square boxes that, and each square box has what I call a line raiser. Now, how did I get the title? I was having trouble naming the book. And so I, um, a really difficult time. And so I called one of my agents who I'd worked with for over 25 years. And Lisa, she said, um, she said, Ron, she says, you've done over 2,500 speaking engagements. She says, let me challenge you with this. She said, if you could leave your audience with one statement that would make them better, what's the statement? And I'm like, going, whoa, that's a bit profound. Yeah. So I went back and I looked at my other books. I went back and looked at all the articles I written, and I kept coming back to this one article that I'd written about my son, Tyler. He was, he was, he was, he was 20 years old and he's getting ready to graduate from college. And uh, I'm like going, okay, Tyler, you're getting ready to get out of college. How do you go about making decisions? And so he was sitting in my office and I mean, I'm a motivational business speaker. He's probably going to, you know, give back feedback or something that I shared with him. And I'm going to be the proud father always been listening to me with basically no hesitation. My son says, it's all about raising your line. Dad." Hmm. I had never said that in my life. I had no clue what my son was talking about. I said, what the heck does that mean? Tyler? He said, life is a line. You're born, you die. It's a lie. And right now I'm sitting in my office going, this is not going good. I'm not getting real proud on this statement right here. And then he follows it with this. He said, if you do something good, your line goes up. If you do something bad, your line goes down. He said, why in the world would I want to make my line go down? And I'm going, wow, what a simple way to simplify it. Sure is. Make decisions that's going to make your line go. Now, if you got to, if you're taking a new course and you're studying, your line's going to be flat while you're doing that. Mm-hmm. But you want your line to constantly go up. That's mm-hmm. the mark that you leave on the world. So I, I sat there and I said, raise your line. And, and and when you look at business, you want your profits to go up. Raise your line. You want your decisions to be right. Raise your line. So when you're you're sitting there, you know, you know Ben Franklin, you know, pros and cons. Sure. You know, uh, my, my statement is, you know, is it going to end up? finally raising your line because it was not one guy's name were you doing it and if you wanted to be successful you constantly need to be raising your line so in the book i have i have over 100 line raisers Mm -hmm. you can just fan through the book if you want to get to it really quick just go to the boxes and there's a line raiser and it cuts to the chase it says boom this is how you do it yeah and, and the reason i think that 2020 why it applies so well is i think so many people came into 2020 at this level 
and and they either stayed here or dropped down. And I think that others of us worked very hard to keep raising the line, figuring out right. new ways to do things, learning, growing, continuing to get better so that we come out of 2020 stronger than we came into it and, and ready for more things to be successful in the future. So I, I like the book and I, uh, I will put the link into the show notes to make sure that people have access to go check that out and look at it. Um, let's talk about talent. Um, I know you've interviewed over 10,000 people. And so we're all about finding great talent here at Circa and, and with this podcast. So what do you look for? And ultimately, how do you decipher whether or not someone has the, the thing that you're looking for that you ultimately want to hire them into an organization? You're probably going to think it's an odd word. I, I look for twinkle. Okay. Tw and to me, when I, when I say twinkle, it's in the eyes. It's, 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 it's a twinkle. It's a passion. It's, it, it's, 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 it's a joy for life. It's a thirst. It's a, it's an, it's an excitement. Uh, what I've tried to teach HR to any company whatsoever. I don't care who you are, what you are, or what you got going on. I can teach you anything you need to know. Right. Period. Paragraph. As long as you got the desire, as sure. long as you what I call it, I call it twinkle. And, you know, if you've got the desire, and I can, and I can, when I'm, and I can talk to you about that. I can, I, and I can, in fact, I, I'll give you one example of it that blew me away in one of my companies. Um, and, and I, I, you know, our, we were looking for a plant manager for one of my companies. Okay. And it was, a, it was a big job. So this guy made it through the gong. He had gone through all the people and then he, so he got to me, I'm the president. I'm going to do the final interview to make sure we're going to hire this guy. So he sits down and I said, okay, tell me a little bit about you. And he says, he says, well, I'm an alcoholic. When he said those words, I wanted to go kill three senior vice presidents. For, putting, right? for putting him in for front of me. For putting this yes. guy in this seat in front of me. And I'm like, I, I'm like, going, how dare you do this to me? You know? And then I'm sitting there saying, wait a second. These are people that I really respect. He must have said something to these people that impressed the hell out of them. Right. So how did how did he how did he because evidently he must have said it all of them, you know. So and I found that he had uh, that was just basically an open statement. So I'm like going. I said, well, no one's ever said that to me in my life. And I said, so tell me what an alcoholic is. I mean, I kind of understand that. I said, but do you drink now? And he said, no, no, I haven't had a drink in ten years. And I said, oh. And he and I said, well, okay, why? What made you stop? He said, my son was born. Now, what he didn't know is we had lost four children before we had Tyler. And at that time, I didn't have any children. Okay. We had lost four miscarriages. And children to me were a really important deal. And this guy said, my kid was never going to see me drugged. I'm wow. like going, wow. And, and, then, and then you just watched him swell up. And you just watched him feel good about himself. And you just watched him tell the story about how he overcame it. And I'm like going, holy cow, who is this guy? You Greatest hire I ever made in my life. You found that twinkle. Oh, I found that twinkle. I found that passion. I found that reasoning. And, 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 and I mean, and he, he was there before I was there. He left after I left. I mean, he was just, you know, I mean, he, was, he was a phenomenal person. But, you know, he had to bring himself out of the depths. So when you look at it, I'm, I'm always looking for Twinkle because we can teach you what you need to know. Sure. If you've got the desire. So my statement is, you know, show up early, you know, stay late, uh, volunteer, you know, talk to mentors. But more importantly, show them that you have a passion that you act like it's your company. You're spending their money or you're spending your money. So I look for twinkle and, and, and a passion of the people and a, and a, and not a, not a, it had to be bubbly, but I'm just talking about someone that just, you know, and, and then, and talk to him like he told me about his problem. All right. Well, you know, don't tell me all the great things you've done. Tell me about a problem that you had and tell me how you handled it. How'd you solve it? Yeah. How did you solve that adversity? You know, and how did you get your people to get on board? And then all of a sudden you, you can start listening to the passion come out. And if it doesn't come out, then I don't, I don't need them. Because I like, I like said, it. I we can teach you what you need to know. I like it, Rob. How can people find you to learn more about you and to even talk to you? Um, just go to my website, robertstevenson.org. 
Uh, that would be the simple way. And then and, and LinkedIn, I, like I said, I do something every day on LinkedIn. So go to, um, I, under LinkedIn, I'm Robert Stevenson speaker. Okay. At the end. Okay. And that'll take you to who I am. And, um, and I try and do something four or five times a day so they can, and, and, and that'll just connect. And it has my contact information there. So now awesome. we're getting about 30,000 people. So unfortunately we won't be able to follow everybody, but I mean, you can still, I mean, we won't connect, but we can still, you can still follow me. Oh, that's but awesome. go to those two. And then my email address is there. Contact me direct. Phone numbers are all there. We happy to talk to you. Rob, um, I mean, don't be surprised if I answer the phone because if I'm in the office, I pick up the phone. Rob, you and I could probably talk all day between the all college right. football days and everything else growing up <laughs> in the South. There's a lot we could continue talking about. Yeah. We're going to have to do this again. Okay. I would love to. I really would. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care, Rob. Yes, sir. Have a good one. You've just listened to another Talent Talks podcast with Scott Rivers. Guys, I love this conversation with Robert. I really appreciate him coming on the show. As you hopefully heard during this, he and I have a lot in common as far as our backgrounds and football. I think we could have gone on and on talking about him being a former All-American athlete out of high school. The fact that he played at Georgia Tech. Um, there was so much more we could have gone into. Hopefully we'll get him back to have further conversations, but I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you got a lot out of it. Again, please reach out to Robert on LinkedIn. Let him know that you heard about him here on the talent talks podcast, or that you were reintroduced to him. If like me, you read some of the uh, earlier books that he's done. He's been doing this a long time, consummate professional, really good at what he does. Obviously a, a world renowned speaker. We look forward to seeing you on the next Talent Talks podcast. Until then, take care, everyone.